Hello, David here with Entertechnics, and today I'm going to be going over Pyroptics image processing software version 1.0. Specifically, we'll be talking about the temperature measurement version of the software. Some of the features found inside the software are timed and manual video recording, timed and manual snapshots, five custom color lookup tables, automatic disk management, full screen mode, timestamp overlay and camera label overlay, five customizable overlays, adjustable aspect ratio for full screen mode, brightness, contrast, and gamma adjustments, frame averaging, histogram equalization, remote iris and focus controls if you have the optional hardware, an optional Intertechnics watermark overlay, automated time-lapse reporting options, eight user-defined zones that measure the average temperature, chart display for each zone and all zones combined, custom chart length, zones can be mapped to 420 milliamp outputs, zone data is also output to a CSV file, and we have custom thresholds for each zone that triggers an alert. Before we get into the software, I do want to take a second to explain what this version of the program is for. So this version of the program has the ability to process and display surface temperature measurements when used with an Entertechnics TLP system. So that is separate hardware found from the normal camera system, so it is required in order to use the software. It's also important to mention that the software we see in this video is set up in a test environment, so the temperatures we see are not an accurate representation of what you would see out in the field as we're not connected to the hardware at this moment. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the software. On the left hand side here, you'll see the live image with some overlays on it and a color lookup table applied to it. Right next to that, we have our selected frame with some of the same overlays. You'll notice it's a grayscale image and this is what's used for processing. Next to that, we have our zone data, which displays the temperature values found inside of each of those zones. Below that, we have our chart display, which again shows the zone data for each zone. Um, and you'll notice there is also a red line. You can see here, Maybe this zone's a better one to look at, but you can see a thin red line there. That is our threshold value, and when that is reached, it triggers an alert that you can see on zone three right here. That indicator is now flashing, meaning that it has gone above the threshold level, and we'll discuss setting that more later on. We also have a combined temperature tab that shows all temperatures at once. Moving to the top of the window, we have the full screen button, which goes into full screen mode. You'll see here on the right-hand side, we have the same zone indicator we had on the front panel. We also have the same live image we had on the front panel, and we'll discuss how to show or hide some of these things in a minute here. To exit full screen mode, we simply click anywhere inside the image or hit the escape key. Right below that, we have our settings button, which when clicked opens up the settings menu, and we'll discuss this more in a second. Next to that, we have the capture image button, which takes a snapshot of the live image. Below that, we have the auto capture image button, which will take a time snapshot of the live image. Next, we have our record video button, which will record the live video. Below that we have record segments, which will do timed recordings. Next to that we have our about button, which when opened up, brings up this window and you can see here it has some version information and contact information as well as the current program state. You can also access a PDF copy of our manual here. Let's go ahead and bring that up. So this manual will cover uh, pretty much everything we're going over today, just in more detail. Um, so if you're interested in that, feel free to take a look. And below that we have our exit button, which simply exits out of the program. Next, let's open up the settings window and talk about some of the things we can change inside the program. So going over basic settings, you'll notice on the left-hand side here, we have the available network cameras. And here we have the active channel and then a list of all the available network cameras that we have. So right now we are looking at the camera with this IP address, because we are looking at channel zero. And this can be modified to view different cameras on the network. Next to that, we have our image capture settings. And inside of there, we have record interval, which defines the interval that is used for record segments. We have the clip duration, which not only defines the duration of the clip for record segments, but also for the regular record video. So if we were to hit record video right now, we would begin recording a video and it would continue to record continuous video in one minute durations, because we have the clip duration set to one minute right now. Whereas if we were to use record segments, it would take a one minute video clip every 10 minutes. Moving on, we have snapshot rate, which defines the interval for auto capture image seen on the front panel. Below that, we have video codec, which defines the codec used for video recording. We also have data storage file path, which defines the path location used to store all data generated by the software. The content saved to this file path will be managed by the hard drive management tools built in the software, which we'll talk about a little bit more here in a minute. And below that, we have the open video folder and open snapshot folder buttons, which will open up the location where all the videos or snapshots are being saved. Next, we have the image manipulation settings, which allow you to modify the live image. 
Right now these are all disabled and grayed out because the image manipulation button is not clicked. So we will enable that. And now we can modify the brightness, the contrast, and the gamma. And we can adjust this window and we can move it over here so we can get a better look at the changes to the live image here. So like I said, we can adjust the brightness, the contrast, and you can use this to tune your live image to get it the way you would like it. And if you do mess up the image, you can always reset it to defaults here. Um, we also have image correction, which tries to equalize the histogram of the image. And when used with the brightness and contrast controls, that can, that can help out a bit. Next, we have frame averaging, which when enabled, it averages a user specified number of frames together. Um, so right now, it is disabled. You can see there's a lot of motion and when it's enabled, it smooths things out a bit. Below that, we have our image colorization and I'll just quickly run through the different options with that. And those are just based on user preference, so feel free to modify that. Next, we have the live image settings. So we have chart grid lines, which when enabled, displays the grid lines on the chart seen on the front panel below. We also have record with overlays. So when this is enabled, any of the overlays that are on the live image, so right now we have the timestamp, the Intertechnics watermark, as well as our zones, uh, those will be saved to both the snapshots and any of the videos we record. If this is disabled, it will be just the live image. Below that we have display zones on full screen. Um, so when this is checked, you will see the zone indicators on the right hand side when you're viewing full screen. So if we go ahead and disable that, and take a look at full screen mode. Now those indicators seen on the right hand side are gone. Next we have display intertechnics watermark, which as you can see is active right now. So that can be hidden or shown. Below that we have display camera label overlay, which you have a custom string down here, which right now says U1 dash left camera. If I enable that, that'll show up here on the top left part of the image. And we have the same thing for the timestamp time overlay here on the bottom hand, bottom right hand side of the image. We can show or hide both of those. Next we have stretch image on full screen, which when enabled will change the aspect ratio of the image to 16 by nine, which is normally four by three um, when in full screen mode. So it does distort the image because it stretches out. Next, we have display live image overlays, which are the zones we see here. So when those are enabled, they are on the live image. When they are disabled, they are off. Next, we have display custom overlays. And these are overlays that the user can draw. And I'll go ahead and do a quick example of that using the draw custom overlays button. This will bring up a window where you have, you can draw up to five unique shapes. Um, I'm gonna do this one. I'll just try and draw the outline of the bed. And this can be useful if you're trying to track the bed growth and things like that. And once we have something we like, we can hit overlay set and then save and exit. And then if we display custom overlays, as you can see here, it now shows up. Next, we'll be going over some of the more interesting features found inside the software. That is the time-lapse settings. Before we go into what each of these options are inside the settings page, I wanna quickly go over just what exactly these time-lapse reports are. The software offers the option to automatically stitch together images to create a typical time-lapse video. On top of that, we also offer the option to combine those images with the data that's generated, giving us a unique look at the entire day's events in the matter of a few minutes. We'll take a look at an example of that here in a few minutes, but first let's go over what each of these options do. Under zone display, we have the option to show or hide each one of our zones. And this only pertains to the create time-lapse report function, which will generate the report with the data combined. Under basic options, we have daily time-lapse enabled, which enables the program to automatically generate the desired time-lapse videos each morning at 12.05 a.m. for the previous day's data. We have hide grid, which hides the grid on the time-lapse report, create snapshot time-lapse, which creates a time-lapse consisting of the raw snapshots, create selected frames time-lapse, which creates a time-lapse consisting of the selected frames, add overlays to selected frames, which adds the overlays used for processing to the selected frames on the time-lapse report, and finally, we have Create Time-Lapse Report, which creates a time-lapse video report that shows the detected and selected frames as well as the zone data with the tracking timeline. And we'll see an example of that here in a second. Under Advanced Options, we have Frame Rate, which is the playback rate of the videos, Percent of Images to Include, which is the percent of images captured the previous day that will be used in the video. Reducing this effectively increases the speed of the time-lapse. 
running average, which is the number of data points to be included in the running average that is applied to the data charts. Open time lapse folder, which will take you to the location all the videos are being stored. Let's go ahead and take a look at an example of the complete report. Uh, the data itself isn't too interesting because this is on a test machine where we're just playing a looped video over and over again, as you can see. So that gives you a picture of what these time lapses are and how they work. Under manual settings, we have a couple of grayed out indicators, and these are just not implemented yet in the software. So at a future date, they will be used, but for now, they're not available. Below that, we have run time lapse generator, which manually runs the time lapse features. So typically, they'll run at 12.05 a.m. if they're set up to be automatic. And if they're not and you want to do it manually, this is the button you would use to do that. Below that, we have our disk management. And so in here, we have threshold and reduce to. And so the way this is set up right now, we have 85% under threshold and 30% reduced to. So how this would work is once, once our hard drive and the hard drive being defined as the hard drive where the data storage is going to, um, which is defined under basic settings. Uh, so once that reaches 85%, uh, the program will trigger an event which will go through all of the data that's stored in that location and delete the oldest part of the data until we get down to that 30%. Uh, typically, we would set it somewhere at 85% as a threshold and maybe something more like 60 or 50% to the reduced to. Under the Output Settings tab, we have the option to enable or disable our analog outputs as well as our digital outputs. So for our analog outputs, that would be our 4 to 20 milliamp outputs, which does require optional hardware to do this. Under analog output settings, we have our eight zones shown down here. And each zone you'll notice corresponds to a milliamp value. That is the current milliamp output value that is being sent to the module if it's active. And right now we can see that it is not active. I have the analog output connection uh, with a red indicator indicating that it is not connected. Uh, green would mean that it is. We also have on the status saying that there is an error. Um, we have the analog output module, which defines the module we're using, the AOIO COM port, which is the virtual COM port that needs to be assigned to this. We have the AOIP address, which is the IP address of that module. We also have the option to enable our digital outputs. Um, and this requires optional hardware as well for our remote iris and focus controls. Um, you have the option to enter in the Digital Output Module IP address, which needs to match the module. We also have the steps per signal, which is the amount of movement that the iris and focus do each time the event is triggered. We have the Digital Output Module Connection status, which displays whether or not you are correctly connected to that module out in the field. And right now I have, I'm not connected to one, so we see a red indicator here. If I was, it would be green. And then we have the actual iris and focus controllers. So you can see adjust the iris to the left or the right and the focus to the left or the right. All right, next let's move on to the temperature settings tab. So under processing options, we have the data log interval, which is the interval that the software logs data to the CSV files. Next to that we have the emissivity, which is a dimensionless number between zero for a perfect reflector and one for a perfect emitter. This value may need to be modified depending on what type of surface material we're viewing. Next, we have the refresh rate, which is the rate at which the program updates the temperatures. Below that, we have the display options. On the left-hand side here, we have overlay font size, which is the font size of the text on the overlay, so the font size of the actual temperature measurements here. Uh, we have the chart width, which is the X or the time scale on the front panel chart down here. And you can see we've got several options for that. And next to that was the temperature text color, which is the color that the text is on the overlays. So we can change that to any color we would like. And that should update on the next interval. All right, below that we have the four to 20 milliamp scale. So as you saw on the output settings page, we have a four to 20 milliamp output option here. And on the scale right now, we have the low end. So the four milliamp section of this would be 600 F or 315 C. And the top end, or 20, would be 1200F or 648.9C. Um, and this can be adjusted. And this also affects the y-axis, or the temperature scale, on the chart on the front panel. Moving over to processing info, we have the TCP connection, which is just the connection between the module where we read the data from, which is green, which means we are connected to it, and red means we are not. 
reference temperature is the actual reference temperature we get from that data. And that is the temperature we use for processing. Basic options, we have temperature units, so you can choose between Fahrenheit or Celsius. Uh, chart running average, this is the running average for the data displayed on the chart seen on the front panel. TLP IP address is the IP address of the module that we get our temperature information from. Below that we have set zones, which allows you to define the zones on the front panel. Next to that we have our zones thresholds. So this assigns the threshold value that we talked about at the beginning of the video that causes, as you can see here, the indicators on the right to flash red or trigger an alert. All right, so that pretty much wraps up everything I wanted to talk about here in this video. Like I said, if you'd like more information, please consult the manual. Other than that, check out our website at www.entertechnics.com. And if you'd like to, feel free to send us an email at support at All right, thanks for watching.